So the stone has been rolled away. The light is shining forth. All of our problems are gone. <laughs> yeah, it's a good day. <laughs> you feel it? You feel the joy? It's a choice we can have at any time, you know? So obviously we're choosing it collectively today. So how did we get to this place, this place of joy, this place of opening, this beaming light? You know, we skipped over some important events this last week. We had the Last Supper communion. Um, we didn't, we didn't uh, acknowledge the, the big Friday event, the crucifixion. And so that's, there's a big part of what went on through this Holy Week to get us here. The story is really a story of Will. There was a guy named Will, and he was... <laughs> Which reminds me, there was a guy named Will. <laughs> and this guy, Will, was going on vacation with his wife, but somehow when they were making their plans, they got their wires crossed, and so he was due on a different plane to arrive the day before her. And so when he got there, he sent her an email, except he had the wrong email address. And so he sent it to this woman who was just coming home from her ex-husband, Will's memorial service. And so she opens the email and it says, hello, darling, I'm in paradise. I can't wait for you to get here tomorrow. And it's hotter here than I expected. <laughs> Our will gets a little confused, you know? And so it was in the Easter story particularly potently for Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of Judea and who pretty much single-handedly had to make the decision in the trial of Jesus, does he live or does he get crucified? And cru the crucifixion was just the capital punishment of the day. I don't mean to make that lightly. It's a horrible thing to think about, and we're not going to dwell there very long, so don't worry. <laughs> we'll be back to Easter any moment now. But to get there, we need to understand what, what did it take to get to this place because this is our walk of spiritual unfoldment. This 2,000-year-old story is our story to own. And so for Pontius Pilate, one of those aspects of ourselves in this story, it's really crucial to look, what was he struggling with? Because he was struggling with the will, right? His, his personal egoic will and the divine will. Which one to follow? And he really saw before him an innocent man. In fact, a man who, when he was one-on-one -on -one with him, there seemed to be kind of an awakening of spirit within Pontius himself. He was a learned man, not so much as, as far as we know, a religious or spiritual man. But he did have a role to keep the peace in the, in the place where he governed in Judea. And so he's got the chief priests, the religious leaders of the day, and their opinions. And he's got this man, Jesus, who he's interviewing, and he's not getting a lot out of him. Jesus is kind of a, hmm, just giving him little riddles here and there, not a lot of response. And an angry mob outside who's yelling, crucify him. And his wife who's saying, look, please, this righteous man, save him. You know, do, don't do this. She said, I had a dream about him and I'm just suffering terribly over it. And there's actually in the historical Catholic Church document story, a story about Pontius Pilate's wife and how their child was actually healed by Jesus previous to that. And so he's got all this struggle going on within him, right? And there's something about this man in front of him. He seems innocent. In fact, he seems powerful. There's something about his presence. He doesn't want to be the one to put this man to death who he doesn't think did anything. And the chief priests, actually, when he asks them, because now the question is, is this the king of the Jews, right? And all they understand when they say king is really that kind of egoic, you know, way of the world, the powerful king who rules over the kingdom. And so he asks the chief priests, is this the king? Is this the king of the Jews? And they completely sell out <laughs> and say, we have no king but Caesar because they don't want to deal with this renegade anymore. You know, he's upsetting the apple cart of the Orthodox Church. He's upsetting the way things are done. He's a revolutionary mystic. They don't want him in their hair anymore. And this, please hear this story, is not about Jewish authorities. It's about 
authorities of any church, of any religion, in the Christian religion, many ways that we turn a blind eye to unjust things, right? And forget the purpose that these religious leaders have to guide people back to divinity. You may think of that even in our modern times, that there are examples of that. So in any religious, in any religion this can happen, where the leaders begin to look more toward the self-serving ideals that they want to have happen and turn a blind eye to the spirit that is right before them. And so that, all that is happening for Pontius Pilate, all that struggle of which way do I go, How do, who do I serve, how do I decide this, lots of pressure. And so he asked Jesus finally, so you're a king. And Jesus says, I'm a king if you say I'm a king. <laughs> And he says, but I'll tell you this, for this I was born and this I came into the world to testify to the truth. So Pontius is curious. What is truth, he says. And that question just hangs in the air. It never gets answered. It just is put out there. What is truth? And it's put out there for us to walk to the answer, for us to walk the truth and they open up that question into the answer for each of us. What is truth? So what is truth is the, the, the question that is left for us and the moral dilemma that Pontius Pilate is left in, we know which direction he went, right? He caved to the worldly uh, pressures. He caved to the, the egoic power of the day and to the will, it seemed, of the angry mob outside but something inside of him said wasn't the best choice. Have you ever been there? Yeah, in those choice moments. And so he's a teacher for us of that, those moments when we have that powerful kind of drama going on in, inside of us and around us. And which way do we choose? Which route do we go? So there's a similar story that Adyashanti tells in the book G, uh, resurrecting Jesus, embodying the spirit of a revolutionary mystic. And this story is about a samurai warrior and a Zen priest. Now there was a village near the monastery and the samur samurai warriors came in and they completely sacked the village. They stole the valuables, they burned what was left, they killed anybody that they came in contact with. And when they finished in the village, they went over to the monastery and a young samurai warrior comes up to an old Zen priest who's sitting in a chair outside in the front in a garden. And the young warrior is full of bravado and he comes up and he puts his sword up above the, the Zen master's head and he says, don't you know, old man, that I have the power to kill you? I could just lop off your head if I really wanted to. And the Zen priest says very calmly, don't you know I have the power to allow you to kill me? <laughs> I could just let you go ahead and take my head. And the warrior is so stunned by somebody who's not afraid of their own death that he just sort of drops his sword and looks at the, the Zen master. And then the Zen master prods him a little further, eggs him on, and he says, oh, you're so weak. <laughs> and up comes the sword again, right? <laughs> And then the Zen master says, that's hell. And it pierces the young warrior's heart with the truth. And he drops his sword. And the Zen master says, and that's heaven. And so the samurai warrior bows, and he leaves the teacher in peace. How often do we walk through life, you know? Putting up our swords whatever they may be, our criticisms, our blame, our lack of forgiveness, our limitation, our ideas that we are small, that, that this is all there is, this sort of physical realm. And then some words of truth or some knowing or some awakening illumination comes and it pierces our hearts and we fall into that place of surrender. That's just where God wants you. In that open stanced place of surrender, in that open heart and open mind, in that place where you can let the truth rise up through you. 
That's what we're really after. And that surrendered space leads us to another aspect of the story that is another aspect of us, Mary Magdalene in the garden on Easter morning. And so there she stands, having seen that the tomb is open and now empty. Where has he gone? Where has her beloved gone? Where is her beloved teacher gone? And she sees a man, but she doesn't recognize Jesus. She mistakes him for the gardener, and she says, have you seen him? Now, you know, Jesus knows who she's looking for, right? <laughs> but oddly enough, in the scripture, he says, whom are you seeking? It's a deeper question. The question he's asking is, don't keep looking outside of yourself. Whom are you really seeking? What is it that you're really reaching for? He says, don't cling to me. When she reaches out for him, I mean, wouldn't we all, if our beloved comes back to life, wouldn't we all want to embrace them? And he says, don't cling to me. And so he's telling her, he's asking her, he's teaching her that your beloved is in here. It's the story all of us have walked, isn't it? Or we're about to walk sometime, depending upon where you are in your lifespan, that we have all loved outside of ourselves to the point that we have forgotten who we are. And then we're on that journey of self-love, and that's exactly the journey that Mary is, is shifted into in that moment. That deep journey of awakening, whom am I seeking? It's the divine in me. And then those who come into relationship with us are beautiful mirrors for that truth of who we are, for that love that cannot be taken, that eternal love that lives in every cell and every aspect of our heart and soul. And so it's that shift that happens in the garden for Mary. And Mary goes, and so do all the disciples, immediately from being disciples, followers, to apostles, to teachers and leaders. And so they all have to find it within themselves. They can't just be looking out to the guru and the teacher or the beloveds or, or the hopeful beloveds, you know, or the alcohol or the drugs or the sugar or whatever it is that we reach for outside of ourselves. The story of Mary Magdalene in that moment with Jesus is the story of shifting to a reach within because it's all there. It's so simple that we miss it, you know? It's so simple. Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven throughout the scriptures. And one of the things he says, he says that he likens it to a hidden ingredient in bread that makes the bread rise. Or he likens it to the treasure in the farmer's field that the farmer finds, and then he buries it in a field that is not his, and he goes home and sells everything and buys that field where the treasure is hidden. You know, so all this sort of antics on the outside, right, to get to the truth that is within us. And so that is the, the, the work for us, is to find it inside, to reach inside, not to cling or grasp outside, and to walk from that new truth. It's a difficult shift to make, but once we turn that corner, there's no turning back. And that's such a part of the resurrection. That's what gets resurrected in us, the knowing, the understanding, the divine love that we are, the, the penetratable, the impenetrable light that we are, the radiant light that we are. And so as Mary then learns to surrender, she becomes the messenger, right? She's the one who's sent back. And what is her message? It's not he's risen so much. Christ has risen. That might be the literal translation, but it's the Christ has risen. I am that Christ that has risen. The shift has happened inside of me. And that's our story. That's our story too. So this kingdom is also likened, Jesus says, to a grain of mustard seed, which is the tiniest seed on the earth, but it grows into this great bush that offers nests for the birds of the air. And so this, this kingdom of heaven, this, this peace, this love, this truth, this divinity that we're after, that hidden ingredient is, is our whole life of, of finding it, right? And then living from it and forgetting all the stuff that we learned that isn't of that hidden ingredient that is the divine or the Christ in each of us, the light and the love and the truth in each of us. So what is truth? It puts us on this path as we ask that question, and whom am I seeking? It turns out I'm seeking the divine right here within me. 
I don't have to look very far outside of me. I don't even have to dig in the field to find the treasure because it's right here. So Charles Fillmore, our co one of our co-founders in Unity, says, we don't enter the kingdom of heaven, it enters us. Now this is a really important distinction in how we see our teachings in Unity and New Thought, how they, they are distinguished from, from other belief systems that you may have been exposed to. In Eastern religions, we often learn about and talk about in the orientation is this idea of enlightenment, right? Burning off karma, becoming enlightened and transcending this world into the divine world or if you will, into the heavens. And so that, that journey of transcendence leaves behind this world. And it's, the idea is then that, that you'll get off the wheel of life and not have to be, keep being reincarnated back onto earth. So the idea is to kind of get out of here, right? <laughs> Ultimately, that's sort of the idea. And in Orthodox Christianity and more traditional Christianity, the idea is that, you, that Jesus is the Savior, and so that you accept him into your heart, and then you live a good life, and then when your life is over, you get to enter into heaven, right? But Charles Fillmore, our co-founder in Unity, is saying something very importantly different. Not that it's a place to enter, but a place that enters us. And this is very much like in the Gospel of John, the more mystical gospel that says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh, and the Word was of God, and, and the Word is God, and the Word is made flesh. And so it's this idea of the Spirit descending, entering into us, and for us to live it on earth. It's a very different orientation, isn't it? It's heaven on earth, and we make the heaven on earth by finding that light and that truth within us. So when we walk the earth asking these questions again and again, what is truth? What is truth? No, really, what is truth? Each one of us might come up with a little bit different shade of what is truth, but how beautiful it is for each of us when we come to that awakening. And as we begin to say, whom am I seeking? Really, whom am I seeking? As I'm, I'm reaching for the Twinkie, you know, who am I really seeking? What is that sweetness of life that I'm longing to imbibe? It's here for me. It's inside of me. It's already here, and I'm filled up to overflowing with that truth. See, the things of the world are lovely pleasures, and we can bring, though, instead of the orientation of the lovely pleasures of the world brought into us, we can bring the heaven out into the earth. That's the way we believe in new thought that it was created. So heaven, the kingdom of heaven, enters through us. That's how it's known upon the earth. Isn't that awesome? To think that you are walking upon the earth to bring heaven. That's a pretty high level purpose, isn't it? So we might, when we think of purpose, think of, well, I've got to be the king or the queen of the, uh, in reign over the kingdom in order for it to be a really worthy life. How about if you just be the best father you could ever be or the best grandmother you could ever be? That is a bringing of heaven to earth, is it not? So whatever it is that we're up to in life, we don't have to go through, you know, great experiences that, that will allow us to bring in the masses, we can just bring heaven wherever we go. <laughs> bring the light, because we know who we are, because we've asked the questions, because we've walked the talk. And now we're just bringing it forth. And that which is not of the truth, that which is not of heaven, that which is not meeting the vibration of the peace and the joy and the light and the love we're talking about, it falls away. It's no longer there for us. It's trampled underfoot. We don't need all that baggage that says you're not good enough, you're not worthy, you're not adequate, you're too big for your britches, you're, you're, you know, you're trying to make yourself, you know, all those things that we've heard, right? <laughs> By whoever we've heard, it's time to let them go. You know, roll away the stone and let the truth emerge, the beautiful truth of the divine, the Christed being that we each are to be that. When we really take it in, it's, it's, um, it's a bit overwhelming, isn't it? 
but it's overwhelming in this really beautiful, hopeful way. It's like, wow, me? <laughs> Who, me? It's kind of like when Moses was asked to, like, you know, come down and lead his people, and he stuttered. He was like, Who, me? <laughs> like, I'm no orator, you know? But yes, you, <laughs> you. Each of us is called. Each of us is called. And we're all chosen if we choose, <laughs> if we so choose. So all these ways of the kingdom of God that Jesus speaks of, you know, the people are asking, well, where is it and what is it? And how, what is this thing? When will it come, they say. He says the kingdom of, of heaven is already here. You know, like how many times does he have to say it? There's always that sort of energy to me. It's like, come on, guys, I've said it so many times. It's already here. The kingdom of God is already at hand. He says, lift up your eyes, don't you see? The fields are already ripe for harvest. It's not one month or one season or next year. It's not what if or but when and I'll get there, you know, and we've got our zillion reasons why, you know, we can't whatever. <laughs> I remember being a young person and thinking, you know, oh, when, when I'm older and I'm retired and I'm not working anymore, then I'm going to read the scriptures and pray more. <laughs> Joke's on me. God had other plans. <laughs> but, you know, why is it that we wait? You know, why is it that we compartmentalize? You know, we're really meant to be living it every day and being it in every moment. And so he really brings it home in this, in this scripture, in Luke 20. The kingdom of God, he says, is not coming in a way that it can be observed. It's not like people are going to say, oh, there it is, or here it is. The kingdom of God, Jesus says, literally in the Bible, is within you. We don't really need anything else but that, do we? <laughs> It's pretty plain English, right? It's within you. This is how it comes in. It comes through you. Let me show you how it works. I'll come in. I'll be embodied. I'll show you how it works. You can heal. You can teach. You can bring light. You can bring love. You can do whatever I do. And greater things can you do because you are the light of the world. You are the resurrected life. You are the one whose stone has been rolled away today. You are the one who awakened into the dawn and the light and the dawning of your own consciousness to remember the truth of who you are. So yes, it's his story, but it's only his story as a vehicle to get inside of us. <laughs> it's about us. We are those Christs. We are those divine beings that are called forth for the energy and the vitality to bring forth to our own queendoms or kingdoms, to be our own queen or king of the realm of spirit. So what is the truth? We walk with that question. It's not an intellectual question. It's a much deeper question than that. The question can get unpacked to what does it feel to dwell in this kingdom, to be the spirited being? What does it look like if I really take on the highest truth of who I am, if I step forth and out into life and allow the big spirit that I am to shine forth? What will it look like that? What can I attract into my life? And not for a minute to go to the places of fear of what might go away, but instead to step forth into the possibility of what can come because what can come will be better and better and better if we continue to walk the lighted path of what is the truth. If we continue to live that question and breathe that question and where is the kingdom then we get it in this moment and this moment with this breath in this now. It's not a what if or a someday. It's now. feels good in here. Like, like we all just got that at once. Yeah. And then it just rises up from that awakening, right? So we all get it, and then we just go, ah. Oh. And then that's the rising. So the rising is the rising awakening. The rising is the rising consciousness. The rising is the waking up. It's like the rising sun in us. 
And the first light, you know, the first light that comes right before the sun comes, and there's sort of that, ha, huh, there's some kind of aha happening in me. There's some kind of vibration happening. There's all of my cells are, seem to be aligning to something, and there's some kind of, of, of consciousness or flowering or opening happening in me, and that, that full sun comes up through us. And so some of us will start to feel that and we'll get scared and we'll run away. I think I told you my sister, who's really sensitive spiritually, used to meditate and she stopped because she said, it was so creepy I could hear the blood running through my body, you know? And I tried to say to her, but that's not creepy. That's like a, a, a new awakening happening in you, you know? And so it's those moments that we turn away. We scare ourselves. So yeah, don't you think the walk was scary for Jesus? Sure it was. Let this cup pass from me, please, God. Until he moved into, but thy will be, be, be done through me. And that's where we go with this will. We go into that place of surrender. Because we know when the times that we have said yes, the times that we have, have walked the path of light, they always work out better, don't they? And so there might be a temporary falling away of things, yeah. And so that can in the moment look like, oh no, uh-oh, or oops. But just stick with it. Because that's just the falling away of the stuff you don't need anymore. And then you get to travel lighter and freer and bigger. And then the yes to life is really like you wake up in the morning and it's a yes to life. Not a hmm, <laughs> another day. <laughs> So that's what we're working with. The Easter story is our story. It's, it's these characters, they live in us, you know? It's not just the story of Judas the betrayer, but have you ever been betrayed? Have you ever betrayed? It's that part of us that betrays ourself when we say no to the yes that spirit is inviting in, into our being. When we say no to the rising up, or we say later, maybe. <laughs> You know, it's those times that then we see in the, in the end, oh, I could have, and we can, because the kingdom is now, right? Heaven is now, in this moment, in this moment. Eckhart Tolle says, heaven is a state of consciousness, and the new earth is simply a reflection in the physical realm of that state of consciousness. And that's what we create together. Imagine if everybody in this room, if we all walked away today, awakened in some way, in some new way, and we continue to be and to hold that light, and, and you know, there was no turning back, which I generally there isn't. You know, we might try to turn back, but generally as we evolve, we can't really go back to where we were. So if all of us walked out of here with a new sense of resurrection within us, a new sense of awakening, and we really lived into that, we really continued to stay with the light. Imagine what we create on the earth. 200 and some people awakened today in Walnut Creek. <laughs> I mean, it's fantastic, isn't it? And so then, and then there's that critical mass that happens and then it's just like everybody is in the presence of your light and so something awakens in them like Pontius was in that moment with Jesus, like something's, huh, something's different here. I'm not sure my intuition is telling me one thing and the angry mob and the chief priests are telling me something else and, which, and my wife is telling me something else that seems to align with this inner intuition, but I'm not really sure which way to go. And so we do know, because we learned from that story of 2,000 years ago that still lives in us, that we do know now that we don't need to be crucified in order to be resurrected. We don't need to go through those deep trials and tribulations. We can cut them off at the past because now we know what we know. And we can be the Mary Magdalene in the garden that says, oh, right, I forgot. The love that I need, the divine love is all filled up within me. And then I just attract companions to have fun on the journey. Nobody needs to complete me because I'm already complete, right? <laughs> yeah. It's a free day when we recognize these things. You know, it's a, it's a new world when we recognize these truths. And we go back out into the world, and I know it's hard because you read the news and you hear stuff, and it's negative, and it brings us down, and it puts us back in our fear, and it puts us back in our anger, and it, you know, so, so break through that. 
See it for what it is, a mirage, an illusion, a temporary experience, because the truth is the truth and has always been the truth, and it will always set us free. That's it, that's it, always. It's just not one of those things that sort of sometimes the truth sets us free, always. And it always prevails, and it always busts through the darkness. The light comes. So that's the journey we're really on here. That's, those are the questions we're living with. It's our story too. And then we just need to follow the guidance as we get it, as we ask those questions of ourselves. So whom do we seek? No one because we're already here, right? Already in the house. <laughs> and what is the truth? It continues to unfold as we ask the question, but the, the real truth that we begin from is it's already within me. The divine is already within me. The second coming is us. We are the second coming. Jesus tried to tell us a zillion different ways, but we get it today maybe, and that's good. That's a start, right? St. Teresa of Avila spoke this truth plainly. She said, Christ has no body on earth but yours. Yeah. And that's what we walk away on Easter with knowing. I am the body of the Christ. I am the resurrected one. I am the life and the light and the truth. So let's hold that in our hearts. Let's live that from this day forward. Oh, what amazing things we might create together as a whole community. We awaken like this. I get so excited when I think about that. You know, think about that. If we all have some kind of light bulb go off, some kind of awakening, some new piece of understanding of who we are, if we walk out of here and say, I am the Christ, I'm the, I, nobody, there's no body on earth that is the Christ except me, this divinity. I am that. I am the carrier of that. And then we want to share it big and wide so that others may awaken to that truth as well. This is our Easter message, our Easter story to embody and to take out into the world today. So let's close out knowing that we are this resurrected life with an affirmation together. I am the resurrected life. One more time, let's say that together. I am the resurrected life. And so it is.